show that we are already situated for this identity change and that it will be a next step in the evolution of our movement. Provide a glimpse of what it might look like in practice and point to some resources to support those who are ready to move. I propose that we update an aspect of our identity from seeing church as family to seeing ourselves as a community of community. I was happy to see the intentional multicultural inclusion in our opening ceremony. We are in the midst of watershed change in tradition that may be standing in our way. Whether we say it or not, relating to church as a family is a pervasive aspect of our identity. So much so, if our use of the family metaphor is congruent with who we are and who we are becoming. In fact, I propose that the family metaphor is actually a barrier to building better relationships and realizing our potential. The complication with the family metaphor is twofold. First, it is far too narrow to describe who we are. And second, it is a metaphor with the power to shape our structures, our relationships to one another, and our interactions in the wider world. Changing this aspect of our identity will change our culture and create new possibilities for our own faith formation, the growth of our movement, and our effectiveness in the world. And this is a time when we need to be sharing Unitarian Universalist principles and values, and when we could be offering community and sanctuary for far more people. So let us claim a community of communities as our identity. Now it's hard to think of this as new, so let's think of it as an oversight. <laughs> <laughs> We've made identity shifts like this before. A new emphasis was placed on our association during Reverend Bill Sinkford's time as president as they encouraged us to think of ourselves as a Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations. And he said that it was an attempt to reflect our reality as a covenantal faith community in an effort to support the most effective, meaningful, and real relationships with and among congregations. We established welcoming congregations which shifted our culture again to a greater belonging and inclusion of the LGBTQI community. This was a system-wide system embrace that allowed all of us to be more of who we are and to better live our values. Beyond categorical thinking was adopted by most congregations that were in the search process. It enabled us to live our values and to open our congregation to greater diversity among ministers from historically marginalized groups. Our whole lives respected young people's right to, to be educated on healthy sexuality. But all, OWL also was about pluralism and about belonging and acceptance and the inclusion of people and families with different expressions. Anti-racism and the journey toward wholeness authorized us to look at ourselves and our institutions, to look at institutional racism 
and to have a more direct conversation about white privilege and accountability to people of color. The Black Lives Matter movement supported the call for teachings on white supremacy, which was issued by religious educators who are people of color. Thank you very much for this bold move. Naming white supremacy challenged Unitarian Universalists, and it deepened the conversation about racism and the impact of a culture and ideology of whiteness in this country. So these are just a few examples that show we have experience with systemic change. There are many more. Don't feel bad if I didn't mention yours. <laughs> <laughs> We've done much more work as we grow and call ourselves into accountability for living up to our principles. This work is far from done. We know that it doesn't happen overnight, but these changes are indicators of our ability to continue to evolve. And this, this process of growth and belonging is actually one of the many gifts that Unitarian Universalism gives to us. It's changing who we are as people. But how do we get better at it? There are ways that we license ourselves to engage in conversations around a different vision of who we really are. And if enough people engage in the vision and some new practices long enough, then we can establish some new norms and cultural change takes place. It's a process that takes time. The metaphors that we use have real power. We think of congregations as family. So let's try on a new identity by making a community of communities the central metaphor for our congregation and for our movement. Let's replace the family metaphor. This really seems like a small thing, but the family metaphor is deeply embedded and ever present in the way that we approach congregational life, whether it's mentioned or not. Family systems theory is widely used, and it has value in helping to understand human interactions, but it is inadequate for leading change. There are some things that might help to explain a circumstance, but they don't help you to get where you're going. The family <coughs> metaphor is overused. Now, I'm not saying to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I am saying that our people, our systems, and our vision of ourselves are far more complex than family metaphors can explain. We should know by now that there is always the risk of arriving at interpretations and conclusions with built-in biases around identity, mm. culture, and power. Let me take a moment. You know, sometimes when I'm doing sermons, I invite people to do the poet snap, right? So if you hear something that resonates with you, let's do a little poet snap, and then I'll know we're like in communication. <laughs> so going forward, there we are. All right, there we go. Good. Here are some things to think about when looking at the church as family. All families have a structure, often a pecking order. Right? There is a narrow lineage, and everyone knows where the authority is. Furthermore, spoken or unspoken, we all know who we can bring home and who we can And think about that when it comes to diversity. Sure, we can continue to try to make the family metaphor work, but why should we? 
religious educators are in a good place to wrestle with this question. Because through OWL, you help people to re-examine the confines and the inadequacies of the traditional family metaphors. The family metaphor is a beautiful sentiment, but it doesn't work as a vision. It centers individualism. Mm -hmm. Our congregations are seen as a group of individuals. Yep. Mm. We so honor the individual that we can enable a toxic individualism That's and right. then feel helpless to call it into accountability. <laughs> Seeing ourselves as a community of communities better reflects today's reality. It changes the dynamic in our churches and our institution and makes room for diversity. A community is invested in the well-being of individual members as well as the collective. And one exciting characteristic of communities is that they have the potential to grow themselves. Individuals within the community feel a sense of belonging, shared identity, safety and empowerment, and that just might translate to a greater sense of wanting to invite people in. We human beings are social folks. We were never meant to go through life on our own. Communities have been a means for survival and the realization of a group's potential. Communities have always formed around common needs and interests. And marginalized people have always formed communities that affirm their identity and their humanity against the backdrop of abuse, discrimination, mm. and oppression. This is true for all of the isms. The community exists out of necessity to enhance members' lives and hostile environments. Anyone who studies American history, especially the people's history, knows some of these stories. I hope when you leave here that you'll continue to read and to listen to them. We don't have time to get into them now. But African Americans in the United States had a unique experience of forming communities due to the history of enslavement and legalized segregation. We had to form our own communities and organizations to live our lives. We basically had to create a parallel society structure to exist and to realize our potentials because white groups were not places that welcomed the potential of black people in their ranks. I would tell a story, but I want to make sure we have time for other things. <laughs> Our larger social movements are about communities trying to survive and creating spaces to thrive. We, Unitarian Universalists, have the structure for a community of communities already in place. It's most evident right here at General Assembly. Look through the program. Walk through the exhibit halls. You will see the communities that have organized to create those spaces for themselves. These are just a few. And, the con and in our congregations, the communities <coughs> exist already as well. The members of the church are proof. I've been out talking with people, and every single person has said, when they come to the UU church, they make a connection usually with a community and the church. And some of these communities exist as normal functions like religious education, music, worship, social justice communities, building and grounds. Many of our churches have seven principal communities. And some others feel the need because they know that the church is a space where it can happen like book groups, quilting groups, mindfulness communities, and more. So it was interesting to see some of these communities having fun naming themselves in my home congregation. 
The first was the Silver Soul. There may be a few people here. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were formed by seniors to ensure that there were people who understood how to minister to their needs and wishes at that time in life. They minister to and contribute to the church culturally and financially through annual concerts, teas, practices, etc. Then other groups started to name themselves, like Young Souls, or that was the young adult group, and Green Souls, that was the Southern Principle group, right? And Souls in the Middle. <laughs> <laughs> And mindful souls. These are all communities. There's a Vespers community and a very strong anti racism community with an eighth principle team. There's a Black Folks Potluck community. You get the picture. Every group <coughs> has its community. But they're usually, well, uh, we all have our communities, but we call them committees. You got the word wrong, right? right? But they're usually much, much more than that. This is where a lot of faith formation is taking place. Relationship building is happening. Pastoral care. We minister to each other in these days. That's right. It's not a stretch for us to center the community. Then, our covenants will also need to reflect this change. We will then need to covenant to support the well-being of and between communities, and not just the well-being of individuals. Yeah, can I? Yeah. Yes. This, my friends, is a practice of the beloved community. Wow. When small group ministries and covenant groups were introduced, it was a recognition that people need a smaller group of people within the church where they can connect on a deeper personal level and feel held. People are more likely to engage if they have a community and if their needs as social spiritual beings are being met. But we missed an opportunity at that time to acknowledge how many of these connections were already being made through our committees. It's almost as though you could assume that committees are seen as church business and covenant groups are seen as the spiritual aspect of church, right? This is just too narrow a lens. Committee structure is not just a set of programs with volunteers, although we treat them as programs. <clears throat> they are often real communities, and these communities are the glue and the power in our congregations. George Lakoff and Mark Johnson wrote a book called Metaphors We Live By, and they point out, and I quote, the metaphor is pervasive in everyday life, not only in language, but in thought and action. Our concepts, structures that we perceive, or our concepts structure what we perceive, how we get around in the world, and how we relate to other people. Metaphors play a central role in defining our everyday reality. End quote. You know? I think that the power of church as family, used as a metaphor, might be one of the reasons that 11 o'clock on Sunday is the most segregated hour in this country. Mm -hmm. A community of communities metaphor is more inclusive of our UU everyday realities. We each experience and understand Unitarian Universalism from our own location, which is largely shaped by our identity and the communities that we are part of. This is very important for us to get. The community of communities helps us to decipher this important truth. 
I have to explain it from my own experience. And I ask you as you listen to reach deep inside to find your own truth in terms of how your location shapes your Unitarian Universalist experience. And location is not just about geography. <coughs> but before I go there, we are a big tent, universalist theology, but we are using little tent metaphors, mm. which shrink our potential. <coughs> so I am a woman of color, African American, that grew up in a diverse Unitarian Universalist church, maybe a 60-40 percent ratio of people of color to people with white identity, with multiracial clergy and staff. We have had people of color as these DREs, even when I was a child, a long time. <laughs> yeah. People of color ministers, administrators, music directors, etc. I have never seen Unitarian Universalism as a white religion. No matter what I do, it will never be a white religion because I live it through my own body <coughs> and communities and my own experience <coughs> in the world. So whenever I hear people say that, there's this thing that has to take place in my head and it says, this is my religion. I do not share your perspective or your conclusion. <laughs> if we look at Unitarian Universalism as one experience, which the family metaphor supports, then we misrepresent Unitarian Universalist theology for culture. And we foreclose the possibilities that already exist. Map, map, map. <laughs> what will happen, what will help us to resolve this situation is to center the communities, not the individuals. Now, I understand how and why people can speak of Unitarian Universalism this way. Because depending on one's location, that may be what they see or what they are projecting. Your projection does not change my experience. Mm. So you have created an unnecessary divide. I usually have to bridge it. What this suggests to me is that whiteness is an orientation and maybe even a metaphor itself. It is not a universal experience. Instead of seeing a white religion, I see one that is learning how to be accountable to the beloved community. The community is centered in my UU world, not whiteness. It never was and it never will be. I staked my claim folks a long time ago. <laughs> and I'm asking other people to do the same. Own your own location. And know that your location is not universal. Unitarian Universalists in Kenya, yes. Uganda, Nigeria, the Philippines, India, Japan, I doubt that they see Unitarian Universalism as a white religion. Wow. Understanding location is very important if we are ever going to untangle this thing. <coughs> the community locates us, and a community of communities metaphor will help us to get unstuck. It'll take a conscious effort for us to elevate the community of communities as our identity over family, which elevates the individuals. So how does this look in action, to see ourselves as a community of communities? 
Well, it's really too early to say with any certainty. And you will find innovative ways to practice being a community of communities based on your immediate environment. But when I knew that this could work for us as an identity shift, it was at a 2018 spring retreat for the New You Ministry for the Earth. And before telling you about that turning point, let me say a bit about my own experience and location. In 1980, I became probably the youngest member of a black scuba club. As a young adult, I watched this group of seasoned divers produce events and training over and over again. They were and are ordinary people creating extraordinary experiences and changing people's lives. By the way, this club had to form because the white clubs would not accept, right? I learned to trust the community. And whatever the idea, once it was accepted, people pulled together and made it happen. But also during the 80s, I was trained to be a professional facilitator and team builder with the federal government. Now, I have always believed that we can create our future, and I wanted to have a hand in it. And so I work, as has become my mission in life, to help us learn to work and live together better. In the late 90s, when my home church went into crisis, I was asked to help. So it was a call give something back. We established nine groups that worked in community for a year on things such as diversity, conflict and inclusion, adult spiritual development, vision, worship, and more. Each community worked on repairing and enhancing the church in their subject area. And community groups met once a month. This was before covenant groups were introduced. But these groups served a similar purpose. We were building relationships that healed and mended the community. This process was an essential component of the church's recovery. In 2010, I proposed a community of communities approach to social justice in the Joseph Priestley District. Uh, we were gonna name it the Community for Justice and Inclusion and we had the concept right, but culturally, we were not ready yet. In 2014, I wrote, there is much about UU theology that is universal, but many people have not distinguished UU theology from the culture in our churches. We believe in the inherent worth and dignity of each person. A multicultural context is a community of communities, not of individuals. The well-being of the individual is connected to the well-being of the community. Multiculturalism embraces, and listen to this, the integrity of more than just one cultural identity through belief in the inherent worth and dignity of each community within greater community. Is that not a formula for social justice? Yes. Yeah. In this sense, people who are already here are not losing something. They are making space for something. Yeah. They are making space for change. Diverse communities increase the vibrancy and range of expression of what is universal in Unitarian Universalism. We may not see the universal any other way unless we see it through other people's lived experience. Last spring in 2018, an experience with the Unitarian Universalist Ministry for Earth presented the missing piece that convinced me that the community of communities is a change that we can make. In a weekend retreat with about 27 people, we explored, the Ministry for Earth explored ways to do their work in a different, more inclusive manner. And to the credit of the board, they wanted to do it differently and they didn't know quite how to get there. They brought in a consultant 
Jerry Coke Gonzalez, who's a consultant and sociographer. I thank Ali Clark for making this happen. We worked in three distinct community groups. The board was one group. The People of Caucus, uh, of Color Caucus was there, and also a Young Adult Caucus. We were led through a process by the consultant. The people in the room, the community structure, and the group process changed the environment and the outcome of that meeting. Our conversations were a deeply collaborative, spiritual experience. Chris, you were there. Each group saw and sees the questions and the work from their shared location. Remember what I said about being conscious of your location. Unitarian Universalism is not a one-size-fits-all. We were all deeply committed to environmental issues, but it looked and sounded differently from each group's cultural and lived experience. Sociocracy is a community of communities process that is designed for equality of input. Think about this. How often do we organize ourselves, even for small group uh, discussions, and we kind of like tokenize people, right? So instead of a community with like identity working together and going deep, 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 we try to sprinkle mm. you know, among all the groups, right? Very different process. This is not to say that we're measuring, but that each person has a voice and that the communities are heard. The result was a shift in how information and experience was weighted toward decision making. What made this a turning point was seeing a replicable, group-centered process that was compelling to see the structure for a different form of democratic process. In many systems, not all, but in many systems, the default for democratic process is majority rules, right? Often upheld by Robert's Rules of Order. Majority rules is another concept that limits our potential. Lakoff and Johnson identify the majority rules as a metaphor for the whole system of meaning. And although our fourth principle speaks to the respect for the democratic process, in a system with a dominant group or culture, the majority rules metaphor defines power much like the family metaphor defines authority. Another metaphor that we can bring into this conversation is the survival of the fittest. In a community of communities, the goal would be that each and all communities survive and thrive, not just the fittest. <laughs> and besides, who determines what's the fittest? Is it those who best conform to the interest of those in authority? If all communities survive and thrive, then we will build equality into our relationship mm -hmm. and eliminate scarcity and internal competition. The experience with Ministry for the Earth showed not only that it can be done among us, but also, you know, we have to think, this is not new. Sociocracy has been done for years in organizations around the world. You may also see it as dynamic governance. And I think about that because we have policy governance, dynamic mm. governance. That's another conversation. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> right. It involves a set of principles and best practices that exist intentionally in the public domain. One of the principles is to democratize, democratize the information so that anyone can access it and use it for free. Now, many of us already have many of these skills of facilitation and, and consensus building and all, but what this showed me was a systematic way to do it. 
principles and practices really do align with Unitarian Universalist values, and they can guide us in examining and changing old institutional structures. Another good point about it is that you can figure out how to design it to fit the system so that it works for you. Some organizations use it as an entire self-governing uh, system of governance. It's up to you to decide. But I'm introducing it as a way to create a culture, a culture in our congregation that centers communities and collaboration within the organizational structure. I encourage you to learn more. There's a ton of information on the internet. I recommend a book recently published entitled Many Voices on Salty Fountain. <laughs> Shared Power with Sociocracy by Ted Rao, that's R-A-U, and Jerry Cook um, Dunzel. I may be saying his name wrong, Cook Dunzel, uh, who works for Sociocracy, Sociocracy for All. It is also available on Kindle, so you can start reading it before you leave. <laughs> <laughs> this proposed identity change, centering communities, is one aspect of it. And then the process um, that's accessible to everyone, those two things can help us to reach a tipping point in our congregations that actually could lead to a cultural change. Mm -hmm. Whatever the demographics are in your church, or your part of the UU world, we can, we can center the communities, and in doing so, we will be practicing the skills of beloved community. So let's talk about beloved community. You cannot build beloved community without dismantling racism and oppression. Let me repeat. <laughs> There is no way to build beloved community without eliminating racism and oppression. Period. They cannot be done. It's a beautiful concept, it's simple, and it is the work of our lifetimes. The absence of conflict is not beloved community. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So I offer you a new definition. Whoa, that's not, oh, you can pass it. A new definition of beloved community. The beloved community to me now is a community of communities that is living the eight principles. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. A community of communities that is living the eight principles. And the eighth principle states that we affirm and promote journeying toward spiritual wholeness by building a universe, a, a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. Wow. Yeah. Look, let's work to move that to vote next year. <laughs> By the way, um, at least a dozen congregations have already adopted the eighth principle. And let me tell you this, adopting it is the easy part. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it is hard. That's right. right. Raise your hand if you're in a congregation that has adopted the eighth principle. I know I see my friends from Hawaii, all souls, good love. All right, and probably a few more, but thank you. So now we go deeper. Building a community of communities is an issue of justice and inclusion. It's more likely that we will dismantle white supremacy if we have other structures to put in place. How many people have been asking, how do we dismantle white supremacy? It's much easier to understand why we should do it than it is to figure out how we do it. And what I've just offered you today can move us a little bit closer to the how. I don't know if any of us know it yet, but this can move us closer to the 
We've got to change our structures. We've got to change our vision. Let me give you another example of a community of communities in action. This took place in a church setting uh, with about 30 people. One group was a group of people of color, one group was for a long time members with white identity, and the other group was for members with white identity who had not been there as long. They were taken through the process, which includes selecting their own representative to become part of the center circle. That was what you saw here. Hmm. The people of color found the experience validated. The longtime white members were not so comfortable, and a number of them didn't think that this new process would succeed. And the more recent white members were in between, a little uncomfortable at first, but then they realized how important it was that they step up and represent and be accountable. The deeper conversation, though, that we were having was about grief. And the people of color in the community had a profound impact on the thoughts and feelings of the entire group. They talked about the importance of learning to grieve collectively. Mm -hmm. New insights that day and understandings of the history of our new churches happened. There were things that we had not grieved collectively. It was a very powerful experience and it shifted the entire group and maybe the whole church. We grieve outside events, but we do not grieve internal events well. This example emphasizes the matter of one's location. And this is one of the reasons that we need to be a community of communities, because it creates room for difference without stopping the change process. Got that? We repeated this process on two other occasions. And uh, I'm not going to go into detail about that now because of time. We have a lot of experience with caucusing in our association. Although some people still push back against it, they're fewer in numbers than they used to be. Mm. And sharing in a caucus with a community of people, more like, um, people are more likely to be vulnerable and to speak a deeper truth. This is such a gift, and indeed it is spiritual work that we need more of. Um, let's see, in 2018, we took what we had learned about accountability from DRUM, and we created a transformation team in my church. We've got a lot of, you all know, we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> um, but this is how it happened. What we learned from DRUM was, you know, the community needs to appoint their own representative. Not that someone comes and handpicks, well, I want this person to serve, this person to serve. And so we wrote into our terms of service this process. Now, a lot of people were uncomfortable with it. They said, trust us, let us just go there. And so these were the groups that were asked to select their representative. If you're going to do transformation in a church, don't you want it to look something like this? Right? That each of these groups comes from a place where there's a contained conversation, where they have a different point of view of the church. So um, I'm going to try and move quickly because there are a couple of things I want to say. I predict that what we've been talking about today will one day be parallel to our attempt to change governance structures in order to grow our church. Mm -hmm. We can change congregational culture and grow our churches. Rather than concentrating more on authority, we can concentrate more on collaboration. More people will be compelled to come to our churches and join because of the community experience. The UU congregation of the Susquehanna, and so our, our churches, our, our communities have they transcend the boundaries of the church and they have the capacity to grow themselves. You just have to support, nurture them, and let them do their thing. The new congregation of the Susquehanna Valley has a very strong auction committee within the church. It's part of their culture. I was there. I was seeing it, hearing it, feeling it, and I started asking questions. They said 85 to 90% 90 of the congregants participate in this auction. 
They reach thousands of people in the local community. They raise twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars a year. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And then they're careful to give back to the community as well. Blue transcends blue. Black Lives of the Unitarian Universalist transcends church boundaries in ways that are amazingly ironic. Here we have black UUs who are activists in the community embodying their Unitarian Universalist identity and acting from their faith values. I have witnessed the emotional catharsis and the words spoken. I didn't know that there were black people like this. Keep in mind, Unitarian Universalism through the blue community is not the same as it is through most of our churches. And so I say this amazing irony is absolutely beautiful, but it's not universal. And then one of the most inspiring stories is about the transcendent power of religious education. My church is partnering with the Union Church First First Church in Rochester on a project called Jubilee Kids. Mm. Our eighth principal team received a grant through our Beckner Social Justice Fund and got to develop this program. I asked the DRE, the Director of Religious Education, Sheila Shu, to write the curriculum. She's been doing amazing work. She couldn't be here today, but I think she's listening. She is. <laughs> so, so in her words, this is the story, and I quote. Here's the clearest example to illustrate how the UU community's commitment to faith development for all ages regarding racial equity and inclusion can have a transformative impact on other communities. A family participates in the church's Jubilee weekend. Two children attend Jubilee Kids while their parents participate in the adult Jubilee. A few months later, one child mentions a practice happening in the classroom to her sibling. The sibling recognizes the practice as racial discrimination and immediately tells her mother. Their mom has a conversation with the school's principal about the practice, which goes very well. And she invites the principal of the school to attend the church's upcoming monthly offering on race, racism, and relationships. Mm. The principal attends the training and continues to be engaged with the resources that have been offered. And Sheila ends with, <coughs> <"Bam!" laughs> We are building a multi-generational and family of anti-racist community. Mm. This program was launched in February and in July. It will happen at my church. Stay tuned. We're going to try to make it available in the future. And so I'm going to, I'm going to jump forward, forward, forward. Let me say no one has opposed this idea of the community of communities as our identity yet. I've talked to quite a few people. But I want to share the last story. And um, Listen to this story and imagine where the community of communities can take us. So I was online listening to a Veterans Day sermon by Reverend Kalani Placera. And he quoted a piece that was written by Reverend David Pyle, published in the Quest magazine. Both of these ministers are military chaplains. Keep in mind what I said about location, right? And in this article entitled, They Just Fade Away, David Pyle wrote, we are called to redefine our movement in light of our commitment to radical hospitality. There are veterans who sit in our pews and rarely talk about their military service. We ought to empower their ministries with other veterans. Churches should find ways to reach out with our saving message of hope listening without our own biases about of war. To do so will change us as a religious movement. Who would know better how to create peace? End of quote. We have so much
much more potential to do good in the world and to build the beloved community. Let's fulfill the promise of Unitarian Universalism through a community of communities and try to actualize the power of we. I want to thank you for this opportunity. Yeah. Amen. Oh.